And that's kind of a similar situation. Jesus is dealing with a religious leaders that were gaining for themselves. I know when I was young, one of the big things was a televangelist. Just send us your money. We'll pray for you. Or your life will be perfect and good. And, and people know that's not true. And they know people buy into it. And they send their money. And they think they're getting someone's blessing. And they think they're doing something good for God. And, and they know they're being... Other people see that. And they know people are getting ripped off. They know they're being exploited. And it fits right into this type of thing. Jesus wouldn't be happy with that. Pastor Juan, how are you doing today? Good. Excellent. Yes. Uh, well, we took a little bit of break, but uh, we're back. We want to pick up right where we left off. So Glad to jump right in. Yeah. Yeah, we've had just some crazy few weeks and some interruptions and even injuries that just kind of kept us... Uh, from taping well, some extra. football season just started. It's not like OTA. Is that where you were in training camp? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, trying to build a house, but <laughs> no, I had a sock kick yeah. back on me last week. But uh, anyway, good to good to be here. Yeah. And uh, so, just remembering back to some of those on the street videos, mm -hmm. and a lot of the videos connected Jesus and religion. And so, I just want to touch on that. Not just today, it's probably going to take us a few episodes. There's a lot to this topic. But what are some of the statements that you remember that people connected Jesus and religion? Oh, yeah, definitely. Just as you mentioned, some people, they connected Jesus with religion. And some, since they did that, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah, it was kind of direct connection there for a bunch of people. Either they, they knew about Jesus because of religion, a bunch of them. And that might go back to Sunday school in the past or some connection with a church in the past or um, Catholicism or another religion and their reaction to, to Jesus. And so religion was connected with what they knew. Uh, some of them were impacted by religion, both positive and negative. I mean, you saw both of those in the in the interviews. And then some, some like you said, because of their interaction with religion, avoided Jesus and yeah. And push back. I think the Jewish one is, is interesting, right? Because Jesus is a Jew. Mm -hmm. But because the claims about him and from him was messianic, mm -hmm. uh, the Jewish people rejected that instead of embracing it. And so we're going to we'll look at some of those claims later on as we continue to look at Jesus. Uh, that is a critical issue. Who do we say Jesus is is such a critical issue to what uh, then we would we would understand and embrace and accept. Yeah, definitely. Why? Well, but like you said, um, you know, some saw the same things as far as Jesus connected to the religion, but I don't think religion is the best way to evaluate Jesus, though. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. And so I want to look at how Jesus reacted to religion because a lot of people evaluate Jesus based on what they know about religion or how religion has affected them. And Jesus didn't wholeheartedly embrace religion himself. So I think as we see a picture of how Jesus reacted to religious people, how he reacted to the religious system, that'll give us a picture of maybe how he would react today to religion itself and may give us a picture of why why people react strongly against religion even in that in that scope. Now, Jesus was born into a Jewish household mm -hmm. and lived in a Jewish culture highly religious community, how did he relate to religion around him? Yeah, I think for us to, to understand that, so that's what we're going to look at, right? We want to look at his reaction. Even to understand that, let's look at some background uh, of where Judaism started, where was it during the time of Christ? So let's get get into that. we got to look back maybe a couple thousand years. Where did it all start? And God spoke to a man named Abraham. Many, many years before Jesus, God was already reaching into to this uh, family line, and Abraham from him would come Israel, and would come the line of Christ, and would come the Jewish people, right? But he, God met Abraham. He spoke to him, and he called Abraham to follow him, to leave his past, to accept God's future, even if he didn't know what God's future was, and to follow, to follow him. And out of Abraham, Abraham chose faith. He chose to follow God, even when he didn't know the, the future. And out of Abraham would come a nation. 
God would give him children, his children, children, and their children, children, and God would create a nation out of that. And there's some awesome miracles that happen in that process. There's a, there's a history there. But Abraham had faith. So that's what we want to key in on. Abraham, if you look at Abraham's life, and I encourage people to go back and read, start in Genesis 12 and read uh, read forward in Abraham's life. His his journey of faith is an up and down journey, right? Uh, his faith sometimes is small and sometimes is big. Abraham wasn't a perfect person. There's there's no perfect people in the Bible, and and I love the transparency of that in in each one of the stories. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat people; it just gives the the raw truth. Sometimes in its ugly sense. Yeah, very but, unembellished. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> unembellished. It's not, it's not whitewashed. It, here's the truth of who the people were that God was willing to save and care about and love. And we're just like them. We're just broken people. Abraham was one of those broken people. Key to that is the faith. He chose to, to follow God in faith. And out of that, God brought a nation. And, and that nation started out in the... In what we would call the promised land, the land of Israel, with Abraham, they were just they were just shepherds. They were just sojourning in the land or tenting there, camping there. They didn't have a permanent home. They didn't have permanent land. Actually, the only permanent land that that Abraham ever has is a burial plot, and that's the only thing he ever ever really owns in the land of Israel. And uh, and then the whole nation of Israel to to escape famine goes to Egypt. And in Egypt, they end up slaves. They end up enslaved by the Egyptian people. And God comes back to them 400 years later. So they spend 400 years in in Egypt. They become slaves. They cry out to God in their slavery, and God shows up. And and so you can can read about that at the beginning of the book of Exodus and, and dig in a little bit more. But God speaks to Moses. And he calls Moses. Again, highly, highly flawed individual. He was insecure. He wasn't ready to do what God asked him to do. And yet he goes, right? And he goes back after... Anyway, a lot to that story. Read it in Exodus. Uh, he complains a little bit. He doesn't want to go. He, he's, he is the hesitant leader. But he goes and he leads God's people. And God does miracle after miracle after miracle. Ten plagues on Egypt miraculously saves Israel out of Egypt, uh, saves them from the same plagues, takes them across the Red Sea, opens up the waters, leads them out of Egypt. The Egyptian army follows them, and God crushes the Egyptian army, which at that time in the world, historically, was the strongest army in the world, mm-hmm. and and then crushes them. And in history, you trace out that time in history, Israel goes in and, and leaves Egypt, Israel Egypt's army is crushed, and it doesn't have a decent army for quite a few years after that point, because God crushed it. I mean, <laughs> we know the end of the story, but uh, but Israel sees all these amazing things. So you, you'd have to think uh, God God worked. Israel saw. What's going to be the natural reaction? They're going to believe, yeah. right? They're going to continue to trust God in faith, just like Abraham did, Isaac, Jacob, all the way through. And they don't. God gets them to the promised land pretty quick, the land of Israel, and asks them to go in. And they send spies in the land who come back and say, no, it's too hard. Giants are too big. The city walls are too great. There's no possible way we can win this fight. We can't take over the land. And and that's a good lesson for us because we can't, right? We're small, but God is big. And... Uh, um, and that's where the faith comes in. The faith isn't in what we can't do. The faith is in I trust in what God can do. But at that point in Israel's history, they hear the, the words from the spies and they say, Oh no, we can't do it. Let's not go in. And they they resist and, and they turn God's offer down. Here's, here's the land of Israel. They turn God down. So they, they choose not to trust him. And, and they end up wandering then in the desert for 40 years. Uh, they end up not going into the land of Israel and end up camping out for 40 years. Now, God didn't abandon them altogether after the lack of faith, did he? Sure, no, not at all, not at all. Uh, and that's, that's awesome about God because we often, people, we don't have enough faith. 
Uh, but God is a big God. And so they did, they turned him down and then God said, well, you're not going to go in until the next generation. Everyone of, of military age that's, that was ready to go in the land, you're all going to die off. It's going to be your kids that go into the promised land. And so 40 years later, they have a chance to go in again. But God didn't abandon them during that time at all. He provided for them. He gave food from the sky. He gave them meat. He gave them bread. He gave them water. Uh, And so they they camped out in tents for 40 years. And and my family and I are living in a camper this summer. We, We spent the whole summer in a camper. It's a little nicer than a tent, but I can't imagine 40 years in a camper, let alone a tent. But, but they uh, they lived through that and then had a chance to uh, again. They had a chance to see if they'd go into the promised land. Yes. Um, so the first time God was ready to give them the land, then they followed God in faith, and with supernatural intervention, they were able to go again to national land. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that second time they step up in faith and they enter the land. So so what we've seen at this point is we've seen Abraham's faith and, and his ups and downs in faith. We've seen Israel trust in God when he took them out of Egypt, but then fail in their faith when they got to the promised land. They got 40 years in the desert and then they choose faith. So we've got some ups and downs in faith. Israel enters the promised land. They live in the land of Israel for 800 years. We continue to see back and forth faith. They'll trust God and they'll commit to him, but it's short-lived. And then a little while later, their faith will wane. They'll begin to abandon God gradually and they'll begin to accept idols. They'll worship other gods and then God will will come in and, and punish them in a way i mean it's just to to redirect them back to him so maybe they'll get a famine they'll get an army will come in and defeat them and this cycle happens over and over again and it's it's kind of the cycle of of people right Mm -hmm. we we sometimes believe we sometimes trust and sometimes we don't we're no different (laughs) we're no (laughs) different we're no better (laughs) no better at all yeah and so that We've got this back and forth, back and forth. They commit, and then they lack faith, and they gain faith, and they lack faith. And you see it. Read the book of Judges. It's back and forth all the way through. Read the kings. Some kings follow God. Some kings don't. And it's back and forth and cycle and cycle. Yeah, definitely. And as you can remember, when we were talking to the ladies from Israel, uh, what the story of the people of Israel is, um, what what um, American history is to the United States is what mm. the story of the people of Israel is for them. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. because that history class. There was, you know, one of the young ladies. She says, "Well, in history, we we've heard about it sure. now throughout this whole time, the God." Throughout this whole time, God spoke to Israel and gave them the words of the Old Testament, right? Yeah, yeah, and that was kind of their to guide. To guide them, right? Yeah, that was their guide. Yeah, and, and those ladies from Israel, their their history is the story of God's work. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it's it's all tied up in their faith because mm-hmm. they get to see God work. And, and God continues to do that today. But all through that time, God spoke... Uh, spoke to Moses, he was able to record, spoke to the prophets, they were able to record. And so Israel gradually developed um, the the Old Testament. We call it the Old Testament. Uh, other other people call it the First Covenant, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, Jewish writings, the scriptures. I mean, there's a number of different words you can use for that, but it's God's word, and it was first originally given to the Jewish people. And they recorded it. And God, throughout that time period, was able to share with with Israel who he was, the things that were closest to his heart, what he cared about, what he desired from them. Uh, He shared, he gave them provision. He gave them examples of his power. He, He fought in battles for them. They got to see God show up in ordinary life by instruction. And it was all written down. And it becomes their guide for their life. But even seeing his power, like the plagues in Egypt and putting off the Red Sea mm-hmm. or amazing battles, Israel still had a, you know, this back and forth faith, rocky faith, yeah. as we, we, you, you would call it. Yeah, yeah, we could call it ups and downs, highs and, and lows. Maybe we could call it a cycle 
where they start to trust and then gradually they don't trust and 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 then God brings them back and uh, some people call that the cycle of apostasy and the, the idea of gradually they go away from God but then God challenges them and brings them back and we get to see a picture of that in in the Old Testament prophets where they write it down they give us this picture and they show it to us the the issue for Israel is God is is long suffering he's forgiving he's patient but you're talking hundreds and hundreds of years and eventually God had enough and he told them way back in the time of Moses so back in the the writing of Deuteronomy God gave them a progress and he said this is what's going to happen and as you walk away from me, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to send I'm going to send a plague, and, and it's going to take your crops away, and mm-hmm. and you won't have any water, and you're going kind to of cry out get your for attention. Me. <laughs> yeah, providential attention. That's good. Probably not what they wanted in their attention. Or or I'm going to bring an army in, and they're going to conquer you. Or I'm going to your children are going to walk away. Or you, there's a number of different things that would happen. Piece after piece after piece. And at the end of it, if you still don't trust me, I'm going to kick you out of the land. I mean, that's the where it ended at the end in Deuteronomy. And by the time you get into the kings, God's fed up. And so the prophets say, God's going to kick you out. And the people don't listen. And so Israel, in, uh, in the, with the time of Babylon, the time of King Nebuchadnezzar, comes in, conquers Israel, takes many of the people away to Babylon, and and Israel is effectively kicked out of the land of Israel, out of the promised land. And so it's not for another 70 years that Israel will begin to come back again. And then that brings us to Jesus, right? Eventually, after they come back to the land of Israel, about 400 more years, they're back in the land, but they're not independent. So first Babylon, then Persia, then eventually Greece, eventually Rome. So you have... So you have some some conquering nations, and uh, and after that time, about four hundred years, eventually Jesus is born, and that's that's where we come into that culture. Yeah. Now Israel came back. They settled down. Did they correct the problem? Did they figure it out? Like they're back in full faith. You'd like to hope so. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, I, they wanted to. They wanted to. So I think that was the big push. And that's what gives us the context of the time of Jesus. An excellent question. The religious context of Jesus' day is their whole goal was not to get kicked out again. Mm-hmm. So we want, they wanted to correct the problems. They wanted not to, not to come to the point where God would say, I've got to kick you out of the land. Many of them in the time of Jesus and before recognized that it wasn't Babylon that kicked them out. It was ultimately because they didn't obey God. Mm-hmm. And that God allowed it to happen. And God, God even ushered it in because it was, was punishment for the lack of, lack of faith, for their apostasy, uh, because they had walked away from God. And so when they came back to the land, the land of Israel, they didn't want to mess up again. They didn't want to mess this up and get kicked out again. The problem is they thought that their failure was was that they didn't obey God good enough. So we didn't obey God good enough. That's why we got kicked out. So to correct that, they created rules. They created this religious system. They became very, very religious. And the system itself was to show obedience to God. To show him that they they loved him, but it was a love of obedience. It was a love of religious system. And then to demonstrate that so that God wouldn't kick them out again. If we're good enough, if we follow the rules good enough, if we're if we can show God we we're we're committed enough, all of that will will ensure that we're okay and that we won't get kicked out of the kicked out of the land again. Isn't that typical though in, in multiple religions out there? Where you know human achievement, where you have to measure right. up and do certain things. Yeah, that's kind of what religion is. It's man trying to get to God. It's man trying to do enough good to either impress God or be good enough for God. It's man to God. And and so what's very, very different for Christianity, true Christianity, is that it wasn't about us becoming good enough for God. 
who is God sending Jesus for us. I mean, so, so different. Uh, we could never climb a ladder or do enough good things to get to God. None of us could. No religion can. Uh, the Jewish people may be one of the most committed religious groups over a long period of thousands of years. It's not about being good enough. Jesus came for us. Hugely different. Uh, but they thought the problem was obedience, but really the problem was not obedience. It was that lack of faith. It was the lack of faith. And, and faith is what God desired. He desired them to have faith to follow, faith to believe in Him, and then through the belief they would follow and be devoted. It, it, God doesn't seek rule followers. He doesn't seek uh, people that do enough good. He, he seeks faithful followers, people who, are, who trust Him and believe in Him and love Him and care about Him and then follow Him. And so, but in G Jesus' religious context, Israel had this back and forth faith, but they tried to correct that problem by, by making rules, by obeying better. In the end, God desired faith. He desired someone that was truly going to believe in him, accept his love, and, and then desire to follow him. Um, not desire to, to do a lot of good things to impress him, but to love him and follow him. And so Jesus comes into this religious context, and he comes to call Israel back. Call them back to faith in God. Call them back into a God who loved them, and a God who wanted them to love him and then love other people. And, and that's what we see in, in the ministry of Jesus. Yeah, definitely. So... That's the background of Jesus as he confronts the religions, mm. the religious society, and the leaders he confronts are called Pharisees, right? The Pharisees. Yeah, you got it, Jackson. Yeah, and one of the big groups that Jesus confronts is the Pharisees, and that this was one of the groups that built a system and an interpretation to to ensure that they wouldn't be kicked out of the land. So we have that we've got the Pharisees, and there's a couple different factions. But the goal was, for, for a number of these, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the priests, um, we have a kind of a spectrum of, of religious leaders, but their goal was to obey God good enough so that he wouldn't kick them out of his land. And that is religion, man's attempt to get to God. And, and so God of the Bible doesn't want people to be good enough, because we can't be. He, he loves us, and he wants us to love him. And then, again, to love other people. And that's the response. If we've re received God's love for us, how can we not then love others the same way as we have been loved? And so we got the, the Pharisees in this context of Jesus. They're probably the conservative party. They're, they're the most conservative uh, group during that time period. We have the Sadducees, which is a more liberal group. Uh, but still, the, both of their goals was to obey God good enough to not be kicked out. Then uh, we have the Sanhedrin. We have they're the they're kind of the ruling group. The and each one of the groups, Sadducees, Pharisees, some of the other fringe groups would have representatives in the Sanhedrin. That's kind of their their Congress to make religious law. And then out of that, there's a bunch of professional people, and you'll see them throughout the New Testament. The priests, they're professionals. That's their livelihood, is, is to be a part of that religious system. And that was set up in the Old Testament. So a lot of what they do are God's given statements, here's what you're to do, and then they start building a system around that, and they go beyond even what God is. So we have the priests, we have the rabbis, and they would teach, and we have the scribes, and they would write down God's word. And so you have these, these theological systems, Pharisees, Sadducees, and other groups. There's the Essenes and some other fringe groups. And then you also have professionals out of those groups that then spend their life devoted to the religious system. Ultimately, their goal was to honor God, and that's really what they wanted but they were stuck in this religious system, and it became more about the religious system than it did become about God. And that that's wow. where the trouble comes in. Wow, that's a lot of groups. I mean, people usually complain about Christianity. <laughs> Christianity is organized religion. I don't want to have anything to do with it. But 
try this. Yeah, <laughs> right, have, right, like, right. So many groups. Yeah, now, even in America, we have a two-party system in government, right? Yeah. <laughs> there was a whole lot more going on in yeah. that time period. Yeah. No, so uh, as Jesus interacts with the religious, um, mm. he's talking with the leaders, theological leaders like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, right, and the professional leaders, some. Um, who spent their life studying the law and keeping and seeking to obey yeah. people like the priests, teachers, and even scribes who spent their life writing down the law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Their whole lives were tied up in in the system, uh, and so as you look into the New Testament, you start to read these interactions. Jesus is saying some really challenging things to some people who have devoted their entire life. To a system that Jesus is poking holes into. Now that doesn't mean he shouldn't. Uh, he brings truth to where where they had had they had clouded the truth, they had obscured the truth, and we'll kind of talk about some of that. But but their whole life is devoted to this. Their incomes, their their prestige, their purpose, their place in society. Everything's built on that. And if you start taking the cards out, the the whole the whole house of cards falls down. And and so understandably there's some times where the religious community is very angry at jesus and you'll we'll see that in our in our interactions we're going to look at yes a lot of background but let's see how jesus reacts to these groups because it's a bunch of them <laughs> sure yeah 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 and and just wanted to give some of the background to that and we don't see all of those pieces in every interaction but here's the system here's the structure and this is kind of what Jesus is facing when he enters the scene back in the first century. Uh, and, and people who had built their lives and their incomes, their, their, whole, their whole life and honor was built on the system. So if you tear down the system, you've torn down their life. And, and they don't always like that. <laughs> uh, that's one of the reasons we mentioned Nicodemus before in, in our episodes. And I love him because he was willing to ask the questions, eventually willing to stake his life, honor, reputation on his belief of Jesus. Uh, but many of his fellow Pharisees, and he was a Pharisee, so one of many of his fellow Pharisees did not have that same that same love of Jesus. Uh, but Jesus comes into this this culture, and so. Why don't we look at the first, this is maybe the first interaction Jesus has with the religious system is recorded in John chapter 2, where Jesus comes to the, comes to the temple. It's during one of the feast systems, and in, in the Jewish system, uh, Jewish worshipers would go to the temple three times a year. Uh, men were required to, from the Old Testament, to come for one of the three feast days each year. So, Jesus comes in during that time period, and and just the the uh, the streets would have been a bustle. It's covered with people. There's lots going on, and you have this first public interaction between Jesus and the religious system. And what Jesus finds is a system that's exploiting worshipers. So we have people who truly want to worship God, and then we have the religious system that's kind of taking from them and exploiting them. And in this system, um, the, the, the people around Israel, some up to 100 miles, would travel all the way to Israel, all the way there to, to bring their sacrifice and to sacrifice during these feast days. And so the, the Old Testament kind of built, built an allowance for that so they didn't have to bring everything that whole distance when they traveled to Israel and, uh, and gave them some ways to work around the struggle because that, that would have been... That would have been tough. <laughs> I, I can picture uh, three times a year I've got to pick my my best animal, my best sheep, or my best my best uh, cow, my best bull, and bring them all the way to Israel. And maybe for me, I'm I'm way up north in Israel. I got to travel 75 miles to get down to Jerusalem, and through the through the mountains and the valleys and the the places without water and there's so much that would have to happen so God allowed for a way for a Jewish worshiper to leave the animal at home or sell the animal at home and then bring the funds to Jerusalem and be able to purchase a a sacrifice we're we're just talking here's how we built 
the culture that Jesus is in, just so we know the background. But John, one of Jesus' closest friends, was able to give us, in his account of Jesus' life, one of the very first interactions between Jesus and the religious community. You can find it in John chapter 2. Read about it there. And John is, is one of Jesus' friends, disciple, follower, and he gives us this picture of Jesus uh, and seeing the, the exploitation system that was going on. So you have a, a religious system, you have religious leaders, and, and then you have this group of worshipers in the, in the Jewish society, and they, were, they wanted to worship God. They wanted to honor God. They wanted to, they wanted to uh, ex- exalt God, but they've got to do it through the system, which means through the leaders, right? And in, in, the, uh, in their, part of their system prescribed in the Old Testament was three times a year men would come to Jerusalem, and they would worship. They would bring sacrifices. They would honor God. Some of them are coming from a very long distance, and so they got to bring their animals, their sacrifices, all the way from some up to 100 miles, all the way to Jerusalem. Uh, all the travel, the dusty roads, the lack of food, the lack of water, all of that, come to Jerusalem and then worship. And they had to do that worship and that sacrifice through the religious leaders. Uh, but God gave a system of exchange in the Old Testament, so that they wouldn't have to transport everything all the way to Jerusalem. What did this system of exchange look like? Yeah, yeah, it was an opportunity for them to kind of take their animal at home, sell that, or bring funds, or bring the receipts from the animal, bring them to Jerusalem, and then purchase a sacrificial animal in Jerusalem at the temple and then sacrifice that. So it's a lot easier to carry a purse than it was a sheep <laughs> or a bull or a goat or the type of sacrifice they might bring. And so, it, but by the time you got to Jesus' day, what was happening was it was a couple different things. Travel, and we know it from just some historical accounts. So travelers would bring their animals. Someone would say, well, I have... I've got my sheep. I've raised it for God. I want to honor God with it. It's the best of what I have, the best of the best. And I'm going to bring it, and I'm going to sacrifice it. It's going to hurt, and it's sad, but it's. I want to honor God with that. They'd show up to temple, and then they would have to present that to the priest, and he would go over the whole animal. And almost always, they would find something wrong with that animal, and they reject it. And then... They would need to then sell the animal and come back to temple with the mm-hmm. proceeds of that and, and buy a sacrificial animal. So they would take advantage of that, wouldn't they? The priests. Yeah, they did. They did. Yeah, because they were the ones that got to determine who was acceptable and who was not. Mm-hmm. And they're also the ones that ran the exchange of, of able to buy an animal. So they, they kind of had the power. They could tell you your animal wasn't good enough. And then they could say, well, but I have the approved animal over here. And they had what was called temple-approved sacrificial animals. They were there for sale. And and so if they rejected your animal, you had to sell yours, and it was inevitably going to be a loss because everyone else is selling theirs all at the same time. And then you would bring your money and buy an approved animal at the temple. And, and their approved animal went for a premium. Because, of course, it's already approved. <laughs> and so they would make, they would skim off the top of that. Now, if you, if you sold your animal back in your village and brought the money, you ran into another problem. Mm. Because there wasn't a universal exchange system. Oh. There wasn't a universal currency. Mm-hmm. And so you'd have town currencies, and then you'd have temple currency. And there was an, there was an approved temple currency and you can see maybe the, the problem that could happen there. Whereas your money was worth one figure in your town, but by the time you got to the temple, the temple money might be worth a little bit different. And again, they could skim off the top of that and, uh, and, and not have fair balances. That was another. You could have an unfair exchange system. You could also have unfair balances where your money would then be not worth as much as the temple money. I think humanly we would look at that and say it's not right. And then for Jesus, uh, and he wants the purity of Jewish worship. He wants the purity of God's worshipers. He wants people to be able to share their love with God and not be hurt by other people. And he's walking into a system of exploitation. And of, 
he's angry. And seeing a place that's supposed to be a place of prayer, a place that's supposed to be a place of, of outreach, get turned into a place of exploitation. And, and I just I picture the Jesus stoops down, he's picking up that rope, he's weaving it into weaving it into a cord, he starts to go after the money changers, and I picture the disciples standing yeah, up. Yeah, I wonder what distance. the reaction will be when they see Jesus. <laughs> yeah, they, and, and he's, they're seeing him go nuts, yeah. and, I, and I picture them wondering, like, Jesus, what are you doing? Like, yeah. This is the way it works. This is normal. Yeah. This exchange is what always happens here. This is this is the way it's always been, Jesus, right? The animals that get exchanged, the money that gets exchanged, this is the way religion is. And I think the disciples are thinking that in the background and and maybe saying in their heads to Jesus, you can't challenge this. Yeah. These guys, the ones that run this, this they're the leaders. This is normal. Yeah, yeah this, these are the leaders. They've got the spiritual control. You can't challenge that. And, but Jesus was not okay with the status quo, and he did not accept the authority of the Pharisees. He didn't accept the authority of the leaders that were in charge of that exchange. And so he, he saw the temple as a place of worship. The temple is a place of outreach. And, and he saw it turned into something that was hurting people, and he wasn't going to stand for it. So he turned it upside down. Turn it upside down. I think he, if he saw that in religion today, if he saw that in the health and wealth gospel, if he saw that in a, in a church that was going to judge someone by their outward appearance or judge someone by, by their background or their past or their, how they grew up, if, they, if they, he saw a, a religious system that was going to say, here's here's all the things you have to do, and if you don't measure up or you don't do the right things or say the right things, we don't accept you. He would get angry at all those things. Yeah. The point I want to get across in, in, in this episode, in this instance, um, but as we look at, at Jesus' interaction with the religious people and the religious system of his day, is to remember that, that God doesn't want religious systems or religious people. And God wants people who truly believe in him. Uh, he's not looking for rule followers. He's not looking for people that are they're good enough. He's not looking for people to impress him. He just wants people that trust and believe in him. Yeah. Uh, we can never be good enough. We can't be big enough. We can't be good enough, uh, strong enough. God just offers us a relationship. He offers us his, his love, his forgiveness, his acceptance. And, and he wants us then to embrace his love, to love him back, and to love other people. And it simply comes down to that. It comes down to our heart before God, not the actions we can accomplish. Not how good we are. Uh, not some system that we follow. He just wants us. Very good, Pastor. I appreciate it. I've learned a lot today. So do you have any book recommendations for us? Sure, yeah. A couple books I brought with me. We're, we're looking at uh, who Jesus is, and we want to get a picture of that. Part of that, we just need to get a, a viewpoint of the culture. What was, what was some of the things going on during Jesus' time? What were their manner? What were their customs? What were the, some of the things about the Jewish culture? And this is a kind of a standard book uh, for understanding some more things about Bible backgrounds, uh, the, the cultures of that day. And it's just manners and customs of the Bible a uh, really good look at some of the uh, some of the backgrounds during the time of Jesus. Highly recommend it just for for your own personal study as you get to know uh, the New Testament. And then, if you want to go even deeper than that, this is Jewish backgrounds of the uh, of the New Testament, and it'll it'll give you a little deeper picture of some of the uh, the culture of the time of Jesus. And that becomes a great way to uh, to understand. Some of these interactions, some of the things Jesus taught is to understand the Jewish culture because that's who he's confronting. That's who he's calling back to God. And, and it comes out of a context. And so it's important to get to know the historical context and the cultural context that Jesus is speaking to. Yes, definitely, Pastor. Thank you very much. And I got to tell you, you know what I'm excited about is that people watching the video that they probably have like a an idea about Jesus connected mm -hmm. to religion. But they can, when they learn the historical account, the differences, and then 
what's we need to, what we need the Bible t- teaches on on, on that mm-hmm. matter, so they they can change their mind, hopefully about you know the the image that they have about sure. Jesus. Yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah. Maybe there's definitely people that have been hurt by religion. Um, and and I would say we're hurt by people, right? People that create a religious system or create a religion or carry out the practices uh, and often claim the name of Christ, we're not perfect. We mess up, and sometimes people hurt people. But being hurt by a person does not mean that you're hurt by Jesus. Yeah. And sometimes we... We see Jesus because we see the broken people that represent Jesus. Uh, but I encourage you just to, to get to know who Jesus is himself. 